Welcome to Compromising Positions. I'm Leanne Potter, cyber anthropologist and head of security operations at a major retailer. And I'm Jeff Watkins, a cybersecurity enthusiast and CTO for a major tech consultancy. Together, we're the tech podcast that asks non cybersecurity professionals what we in the industry can do to make their lives easier and help make our organizations more prepared to face ever changing human centric cyber threats. In today's episode, our guest, Josh Nesbitt, CTO of Glean, a Leeds EdTech startup, shares insights on securing data of vulnerable people and the importance of accessibility and compliance in production ready products and the challenges of achieving usability, functionality, and security in concept. Join us as we debunk common misconceptions around Agile and explore how security teams can be more creative in their approach. We're going to talk about how to use tooling and engagement to get engineers and security teams on the same page. We love this chat and we think you will do too. So sit back and enjoy our interview with Josh Nesbitt. Welcome. Today we have with us Josh Nesbitt, CTO of a Leeds-based company called Gleam. Uh, Josh, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for having me. So yeah, I'm Josh Nesbitt. Uh, I, as you mentioned, I'm CTO at Gleam, based out of uh, Leeds Dock in Leeds. And before that, I also ran my own software consultancy called Stack for about 14 years. Tell us more about Hey. Hey is a great project that you do. But yeah, so I didn't mention it, but alongside the uh, consultancy I run, I also run a, an events company. The main event for that is a conference, which is a single track conference once a year called All Day Hey. It's essentially aimed at digital creatives you know who want to come and learn more about kind of technologies but also generally around the culture surrounding kind of software development and anything around the kind of technical creative space what i like about hey and the work you do is you don't just get the same voices on all the time you really do manage to find some incredible speakers so if you're ever looking for a conference with a bit of a difference i would strongly recommend all day hey so do google that and check it out for the next one thank you for the plug yeah <laughs> yeah it's um it's been going for about eight years now uh, i'm really proud of it try really hard to create that really nice inclusive kind of conference space where everyone just feels like they can chat with each other and, and kind of get to know each other. So yeah, really, really proud of it. So check it out. So you're the CTO of Glean. Do you want to maybe just tell us a little bit about what Glean do as well? Yeah. So uh, so Glean is in the ed tech space. So uh, essentially they kind of came to uh, to be a much bigger company through this product called Audio Note Taker, which was essentially about providing students with disabilities with tooling to better take notes and to digest the information in classrooms. So the initial use case was creating kind of accessibility support software for students uh, and now it's kind of grown much much bigger than that We're looking at different ways that we can accommodate different learning environments and really just help students to essentially absorb that information and better their learning so initially it was from the disability services kind of allowance space but now we're looking at more mainstream support how we can get the products in as many hands uh, as possible and just kind of support as many students as possible i guess from an angle thinking about you're actually capturing a lot of people's own i guess personal information i mean although i imagine lecture notes aren't the highest sensitivity data what what kind of approach do glean take to securing some of that yeah so it, it, it is pii really if you think about it in a variety of different ways even though the course material is available there's quite a big responsibility ability to ensuring these these applications are secure. One of the main reasons is that we're, we're dealing with a more vulnerable group of people really is, is one thing to recognize and we need to really respect at, at all times the security but especially when you're dealing with vulnerable groups. So yeah a lot of the technology is kind of always local first so a lot of the stuff is on device so the recordings a lot of the data is stored in local storage and then there's kind of synchronization um, components which make sure that that gets uploaded to the back end so we only really publish the information that we need so some of that might be audio recordings some of it might be kind of contextual data about when the recording happened and, and whatever but, but yeah there's, there's a lot of effort to secure the applications we have an amazing team called engineering experience that really help secure the kind of devops side of things ensure that we're following as many best practices as possible uh, ensuring that we're educating the engineers to, to kind of build the best uh, applications we can really so yeah lots of different touch points of where where things could go wrong as well i guess so i mean obviously the um, glean's quite a modern startupish kind of company and but you've worked in a number of different companies and industries What's been your general experience with cybersecurity teams and what, what have you found a challenge in the past and what has been good and what can you take from it? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 varied, right? <laughs> it depends on a lot of things. I should uh, say a note for the audience listening here that I, I actually was one of the security people for Josh. So when he's talking, I'm sure he's not going to be talking about me, which I'm sure was a brilliant experience. But go <laughs> ahead, Josh. Go ahead. I'm listening. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Obviously, Lee. 
<laughs> nothing, nothing to do with our relationship at work, uh, Leanne, at all. It's really about the kind of cultural side of these companies, right? So uh, me, me and uh, Leanne worked at a very large kind of red brick insurance company that had been around for a long time. I, I guess a lot of the security uh, attitudes there maybe were, were brought along from, from a very long time ago, whereas I think you don't have with newer companies situations where maybe you'd have that sort of history to inform your, your security strategy. So I guess it would allow you a lot more maneuverability when it comes to defining a strategy and implementing it. It's always easy easier in some ways to start from scratch than try and augment a, a big beast of a machine. I mean, certainly that's my experience. It might might not be true for everyone, but I've, I've definitely learned a lot from coming into companies that have been in existence for a very long time and trying to change some of those attitudes towards security versus maybe a startup or a newer company where you can look at best practices and kind of start with a, a much better foundation. But your mileage may vary. That's that's my experience. I was just thinking, you know, you were talking about how you're at Glean, how the engineering function is set up and what did you describe it as again? Was it the engineering? It's engineering uh, effectiveness. It's the first time I've heard it labelled that in an in a organisation, actually. Uh, I think usually you call it like DevEx, maybe. Yeah, so so I guess it's kind of like the developer experience component of a, of a team. So loads of companies have really championed this over the last few years. Netlify do a really good job of it. If you're familiar with Netlify, they have a really good DevEx um, team. I'm biased because Phil uh, is, is one of the team leads there and he helps actually MC the conference. So <laughs> definitely biased. Yeah, I think it's all about unlocking the potential of engineers, allowing engineers to focus on the actual build and creative side of the, the job while ensuring that we have some guide rails to you know identify best practices ensure that things are built properly security obviously plays into it quite heavily how we bake security into for ci cd for example so yeah it's really just a, a team that supports the efficiency i guess of, of the engineers on the ground it just sounds to me like there's loads of opportunities for security to get involved there and, and kind of be at the forefront by having your engineers set up in that way you're only really asking that the main driver there is let's make this easier for everyone. And that, I guess, would include things like the security, but other areas of the business as well that might compliance and stuff that might get kind of left traditionally to towards the end of the process. And then that's when you get your costly delays and your tech debt and things like that. Yeah, you definitely see. So yeah, legal is definitely involved. Uh, as you said, compliance, looking at different you know certifications you might need for certain uh, engagements, things like that. So it's, it's good to bring all that stuff really closer to the development process. Some of my experiences of security teams is that you don't really engage with them until later on in the process. And obviously that that's where you get that sort of ivory tower teams that block progress, it feels, but that's not really the case. It's just that they're informed too late, really. They were brought into the process too late. Whereas, obviously, if you bring that collaboration closer to when the actual build happens, better things occur. That's, that is an interesting point, I think. There is that whole over-the-wall mentality. I remember this used to be the same with QA. QA used to be kind of, well, we've built the software. Here it is. And if... if you find any problems, then we're just going to call you a blocker. It's difficult for anybody, I think, to do an effective job if they're invo involved far too late in the day anyway. Yeah, I think it's because, you know, in software development, there's, there's in some cases, there's a focus on the MVP or something like that. And the MVP is maybe just like the, the bare bones functionality of what needs to be delivered. And sadly, for one reason or another, I feel like things like accessibility and security and compliance, everything around that isn't always included in that process. So the MVP never really defines some of the really important factors that make an application production ready. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think I find that a lot is people are unwilling to focus on the non-functionals because they've seen a functional MVP that they're barreling towards. And that's a really interesting point is that there should be, the, the should pro probably in my opinion, be at least like the MVP for non-functionals as well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and it depends on the it depends on the space that you're operating in, right? So with Glean, for example, it has to be a, a focus on accessibility first, considering the use of the product and, and the kind of audience that it's targeted at. So I guess it depends on the sort of product or company you're working within. So like what gets precedence, you know, accessibility might get more recognition in somewhere like Glean, but it might not in another company. But it's also strange because, you know, I know they keep changing the um, legislation on this, but from an accessibility point of view, it's public facing. There's kind of an onus on you to, to, to do this in order to avoid actually being taken to court, which is something I always find quite odd when people create a public facing service. I mean, so certainly like in the GDS, things like that wouldn't fly. They're, they're absolutely making sure that all users can access the service. And when um, I, always, I quite often hear is, well, we don't need a Rolls Royce solution. And I think this will depend on industry and what, and what your drivers are. But like, okay, not every car needs a walnut dash and and, a, and all of the bells and whistles. But you can't say, well, we're not building a Rolls Royce, so therefore we don't put seatbelts in. You know, that that wouldn't fly. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and you know, we're, we're, we've come a long way with accessibility, for example. I think, you know, it's, it's more than just slapping a few ARIA attributes on, on an element in the DOM and things like that. But, you know, also it's about how you think about accessible language. It's how you think about accessibility in a very human way, which kind of back to the conference we mentioned earlier, it, it makes you think about how you create inclusive spaces, how you create inclusive language, and all those sorts of things play into it too. So, yeah, uh, just like just like that with security as well, you know, there's a very human aspect to security. You know, humans usually the ones that are easily exploited in that scenario right so well that was an interesting one i was going to ask about um your experience for accessibility and security because we had somebody the other day talking about well it's all like the kind of curse of knowledge it's all all very well like putting security measures in place but if you're if they aren't accessible or understandable to your users you've got a real problem hmm yeah yeah i think it depends so the onus really shouldn't necessarily be on the user to ensure that your your thing's secure right you you shouldn't really load that responsibility onto them in a lot of cases unless there's a very specialist part of, especially especially in an industry where you have to kind of bring that into it but but yeah it's it's interesting i think ultimately there's a few different ways we can talk about security here isn't there i guess i'm coming from the kind of software development angle but you know there's very much kind of like there's, there's loads of other parts of infosec we should t- we could touch on i guess yeah and i think it's um coming from like you've said before the owner shouldn't be on the end user to ensure things secure and I, and I agree because as soon as they access your product you're kind of indicating that there is contract of trust there but what I'm seeing is and I don't know with you know you both do recruit in this space because obviously you both work in engineering a lot more than I do now and I'm just wondering when it comes to things like you're doing the hiring process and you know you're getting some like grads and stuff in how much uh universities do you think being taught and when they're picking computer science as a degree about accessibility and security you know when you're interviewing people about that do you ever hear anyone kind of saying oh that was my favorite module or this is really important i think i think unprompted it doesn't get mentioned enough certainly when i was, I was at university and that was a very long time ago <laughs> um there was no focus on security really as part of the curriculum it was quite a basic course in terms of this is how you build some things Good luck. <laughs> um, but as part of that, you know, there was, you know, in programming, there was never any talk of, oh, be careful. This could be like mass assignment or be careful about how you build applications in this way. Like that's, that just wasn't a part of the conversation. I think it's got better for sure because we've had very good examples in history of exploits that have cost reputational damage to companies. But I don't think it's focused on enough as like a dedicated curriculum topic. Um, I think it's more kind of like a peripheral. Oh, and by the way, you should probably think about this. I agree with that. And academia is often, I was going to say a decade, but I think I may be going to be less charitable than that. Certainly beyond the decade behind the industry and going back to study ostensibly um, a master's degree in cybersecurity, I found that actually I'd say the materials, even even at well-regarded Russell Group universities, aren't where I'd expect them to be, which I think I think is a bit of a problem. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I remember, you know, I was at university, what, 15 odd years ago, maybe. And I remember studying Ruby on Rails in my spare time. Uh, this was like a new and upcoming framework at the time. And uh, I took it to my tutor and he didn't have a clue what Ruby was, a clue what Rails was, literally just knew this PHP part of the curriculum. And that's not a, a slur on him or his knowledge, but it's more kind of like the responsibility really should be on the educators there to to really be kind of pioneers in that industry. That's probably leading into a whole conversation around education that we haven't got time for but i just thought it was quite interesting that it wasn't really you know because ruby on rails was very popular at the time for, for its security features uh, a, lot, a lot of other frameworks weren't protecting that sort of stuff so okay then well so josh you haven't been to university in 15 years but at the time not really seeing anything jeff you did computer science and cybersecurity, didn't you? Recently, you, you literally graduated this year and you're not seeing it really there, even though it was a cybersecurity specific one. Concerning, concerning. Uh, so I guess the question is then, so me working closely with the engineer, I have a DevSecOps function in my team. What can I do as a security person to get these engineers to where they need to be? So I think it's it's kind of back to what I was mentioning earlier, which is around that collaboration process. So it, you need to bring it much closer to, to the build experience really for me so you know a lot of the ways that you can do this in a low friction manner is bringing it into your pipelines you've got things you know like githubs uh github actions marketplace is absolutely amazing now uh, there's so many things that with a, with a touch of a button you can just literally embed better security scanning in your code base almost immediately i, I think when you bring that 
that closer to the build, you know, in, into pull requests, into the flow of an engineer, there's a bit more respect and acknowledgement for the time it takes to kind of build things properly. Um, and also, it's a, it's a bot or a tool telling them to improve something. It's not a human being, which doesn't always end that well either. And so, you know, it's just like any good linting tools or something. I, I think bake it into your development process. Bake it into if you're completing like a dev ticket where there's a, a chunk of work that needs to be delivered. Bake in the, the criteria for completion to be it has to be passing on these security kind of flags or you know or things like that you know i think it's important to bake it into the process yeah i, I found that was a very one of the, one of the unexpected benefits of uh, cicd most people don't like it when you call their baby ugly and you review their code but when when there's an automated and completely impartial system in place that goes sorry your build failed people take it better i've which is strange because usually people think of that whole thing of trope of computers saying no and everybody gets really angry. But actually, yeah. I find people take it much better than they do off a person. <laughs> Yeah, especially when you've got kind of pre-agreed rules, right? So the, the common one is like linting, which is, it, it's essentially like a, a tool um, which will scan your code and talk about stylistic differences or th common errors that occur in programming. If you agree on that style guide as a team up front, then it really takes a lot of the, the friction out of making those improvements. And I, I see security in, in a similar way, really. If you agree as the baseline uh, acceptance criteria for what what is a secure application, then it just makes that really easy as part of, right, okay, this feature is done but oh we haven't done this or that and it's just a really nice tidy checklist to make sure that you're doing the best you can i guess going on to that um i'm i'm really interested in security tooling and automation because one of those things is security teams and security individuals even security champions in projects quite often underfunded so using mm. the power of technology so like where um at x design we're a sneak partner as well as uh quokka who are a mobile mm. application um app tech. i should i should say if uh, any sponsoring opportunities from either of those companies <laughs> yeah. is very much much welcome. Have you come across any, because you sort of work in this space, have you come across any really interesting um, automated tooling that can help along? You just mentioned GitHub Actions there. Yeah, I mean, Actions, you know, I, 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 I quite like linting tools as a kind of starting point for static analysis of code bases. I think obviously they don't always catch a, all of the security issues, but they do catch a lot of common ones. This, it depends on your framework. It depends on your language that you're using. Um, there's loads of good ones in the in the Node and Ruby space. Um, there's one called Rubocop in in Ruby, which I love, uh, which is really good, mainly for the name. The name's just great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just love the name. Yeah, they had me at RuboCop. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's it's a really good tool. Um, you you identify uh, all all the config in uh, in YAML. Like M npm has loads of tools for this stuff too. Like you can chuck stuff into your package manager. But the reason I like it is that you've got your you've got your kind of rules or your acceptance criteria as code. The config literally defines the the base kind of set of security config for your for your app, I guess. So I really like linting tools. I think it really stops a lot of pointless conversations between engineers and security teams. But yeah, as you mentioned, sadly, a lot of security teams are really underfunded and they, they get trimmed down quite quickly if you're looking to prioritize teams that deliver. Sadly, security teams are one of the first to suffer along with maybe accessibility teams if you've got one of them in, that, in the organization. And that's a real shame. So I think that sort of tooling is also a really valuable mechanism to communicate the value of those teams and to really justify the existence of specialists in that space because you know you can really highlight the as we've said earlier the reputational risk the operational risk within the company if you don't have those sorts of people around what do you think of security champions i have an opinion which i'll share with you afterwards but you have you got any experience with security champions or if you haven't or what's what are your opinions on that so the problem, the problem with champions in general, and um, we'll use security champions in this context, is that it's. I see it kind of like a town crier just running around a town, screaming things, hoping that people will listen. And actually, it's not really something that gets embedded into the teams themselves. So I think the challenge there is that you've usually got one or two people who are like, everyone, we need to build this really, really well. <laughs> and this is what we need to do. And they go, yeah, cool, nice one. Uh, and then they kind of go about their day probably because it's it seems like additional effort that time, right? It seems like additional things to do, more work, essentially. And that's kind of what I mean about the collaboration between those those specialists they need to be embedded in the teams or working with the teams a lot more closely than just being a champion that usually sits outside if it's if you've got bloody tribes and squads and whatever maybe it's a chapter champion or whatever like but they're always like peripheral members aren't they or it feels that way i'm interested in your perspective well i think we in the security industry we've been placing so much stock in security champions when it comes to the dev space i think we're 
treating it a bit like a silver bullet. If we only just got some security champions in that space, everything would be fine. And I just, I honestly just don't think they work. That's not to say that I don't encourage people who are interested, devs or anyone else in, who's not in the security space, who are interested in security to come reach out to us and say, I want to learn more. Love that. That's great. Great. And, and we'll give that training. But I think the challenge though is that you are making them responsible and accountable for all the security. And it's like, that's also a lot to put on one person. But then it's also, you're probably not empowering that person to succeed because they haven't got the authority maybe to make these things happen. I don't know. That, That's precisely what I was going to say. But we pick the, the wrong people for us. And we're going to do a Security Champions program. We pick the wrong people. I don't think we should be picking devs. I think we should be picking pro product owners because they're the ones that they're the ones that are picking what's going on the backlog, really, to start with. You know, you know what I mean? Like the initial stages, understanding what's going on there, getting them interested in the security first. And actually, when we're picking our tickets, Let's think about it that way. Um, so that's my kind of soapbox moment there is that I don't think the way we do security champion programs work at the moment. I think it's it's really interesting to have them. I think the embedded element of them, I think is utterly critical. So um, our security champions are actually, each project team does have a security champion that's being trained, but they're directly in the actual project team. I feel like somebody who's a champion champion from the sidelines is like somebody who's sitting down with a can of beer watching a football match and say, oh, I wouldn't have passed the ball <laughs> like that, which is not really much. Yeah use it just frustrates both parties i imagine yeah well it, i mean how soul destroying would it be just constantly saying like your your trained opinion on exactly what you need to do in a certain scenario and it just getting down downplayed or, or deprioritized or and you know often you see these <laughs> welcome to my life <laughs> <laughs> i was going to say tech soapbox it's um you know you're living up to your name on, on twitter or x or whatever the hell it's called now the big question is then what do you want the cyber security team to do to make your life easier you know, you're a CTO now, you've got a lot of things to juggle. Security is one of them in, in a sense. What, what do they need to do to make your life easier? Um, I guess it starts by understanding where the gaps are, right? So uh, understanding what a good security strategy looks like, understanding kind of responsibility of security within that organization, and then looking at where the gaps are and looking at how we can kind of proactively solve them together. I think collaboration is a strong theme in, in, in a lot of things that I do. So I think for me, it's definitely about the collaboration and the willingness to put your neck on the line a little bit and, and, and get involved in the teams and, and really represent that security perspective. Because, you know, there's I used to work at Sky many moons ago and we had some really great accessibility experts who were kind of working with the teams to help people understand, you know, exactly what we needed to do to make the Sky products more accessible. And I feel like the way, again, back to those those embedded people in teams um, was just really powerful. So I think it's, it's, a, it's also about breaking the perceptions, isn't it? Everyone thinks that security specialists live in this ivory tower and just block things from getting done not really true it's just that they're trying to ensure the quality and security of what we're shipping is is as good as it can be and, and we need to listen mm, i think so in, in agile terms if you're almost turning um chickens into pigs for those who, uh, who've had the, heard the old parable of the uh, chicken and the pig starting in a ham and egg uh, restaurant and the chicken says i want equal footing with you and, and the pig goes well not really, because you're only involved. I'm fully committed. <laughs> and but I think with sometimes with security, it's kind of pig, chicken, and the farmer waving the pitchfork from the distance. But I think turning more people by getting people embedded into an agile delivery from a security point of view, like turns them hopefully into pigs rather than chickens. <laughs> uh, that's a new one on me, but I'll I'll, I'll definitely be using that in the future. <laughs> I've been thinking about the work you've been doing. Uh, I think there's probably a lot of misunderstanding about what a dev function does. What I hear a lot when I'm speaking to security teams that are probably a bit maybe set in their ways. I'm quite lucky because, you know, I used to be a developer. That's my first tech role. So I kind of, I know how you guys work. But when I go in and I start talking to security people about agile, it kind of blows their mind. Like, oh, that's just two week sprints. Like, What's the point of working in that way? What do you think one of the, some of the big misconceptions are about the work you do in engineering? I guess when it comes to Agile, it's, it's a hugely popular approach to building software because of those short cycles. You can get the feedback quite quickly about team performance and how the product is, is going, if it's a product-based business, of course, which a lot of the, the clients I've worked with have been product-based. So yeah, I think it's it's probably that you don't have to plan if, you, if you're doing Agile. I think that you don't have to plan on document is one of the biggest mis misconceptions. And it, you know, good documentation is, is, is really core to a lot of good teams, I think. 
everything and making sure that you can easily get, get information and knowledge where, where you need it. And I think security is probably part of that, right? So documenting your expectations of what good security looks like is a really important thing to do. And, and I guess as part of those those two week cycles, talking about the outcomes of those sprints, you know, you usually do retrospectives, which usually is a look back on how how the sprint's gone, how performance was, anything that we kind of missed or, or didn't deliver on. And at that point, it's a really good opportunity to uh, to talk about maybe where security, the focus on security slipped, or or maybe we've not quite delivered those parts of the sprint goals. So yeah, I think that's a really good point to catch the, oh, we delivered the feature, but it's not accessible or secure. <laughs> Let's fix that. Just changing gears a little bit. So I think you're pretty much an expert in bringing creativity and diversity together throughout things like your conferences and you know I've worked with you personally as well and I've seen that in your work what have you learned about your journey to achieve creativity and diversity of thought and I think that was a lot that could be applied to security from the things that you do that's very kind words um <laughs> uh, yeah I I don't know really I think I think the reason I started the events 10 odd years ago and the conference uh, a little bit after that was just around trying to create a space that people could see themselves in somewhere where they they could see themselves existing and that's that's about good community creation right inclusivity accessibility making people feel welcome because ultimately if you build that space where people feel like they can trust you and they they can be a bit vulnerable with you then you're already on you know ahead of the others in terms of getting people to agree and work with some of the, the the ideas that you have so for me it's just about creating an environment where a team or community of people trust you enough to kind of follow your direction or or, or listen to kind of your opinions on things and of course as part of that you need to also let people air their opinions on things because a lot of these projects you know seem to go wrong when people have differing opinions on what what good looks like or you know what a successful launch looks like for a project and some people think that security is not important some people think that it's paramount and it's just blending those opinions together into something that works as as a product I guess. yeah i think uh, like with a lot of non-functionals things like security don't matter until everything goes wrong and then suddenly it matters more than anything else in the world the best that's best thing that can happen to a security team is a breach because then we get my budget <laughs> or a breach in your competitor that that, that helps as well <laughs> so you'd have to deal with them the mess <laughs> Yeah, it's, you know, you don't know, you don't know you need it until until it's too late, really. Uh, and and really, it's just about, you know, on, on, a, on an operational level for a business, it's about doing your homework and, and doing your due diligence to make sure that you've, you've covered those those aspects. Because, for example, me as uh, Glean, as a CTO, I'm responsible for for that. Uh, it's, a, it's an area that I need to ensure is is looked after. So, yeah, I think it's, it's an interesting thing. I guess because you work for a couple of product companies and also you you creative type, part of that, I think, is, is the ability to innovate. And do you think security teams can be innovative like a product engineering team? And how would you how would you build some of that spirit of innovation into a team? Yeah, I think absolutely. I think it's just a, it's just another dialect of creativity in a team to me. Um, I don't see it as a anything other than that really. How would you make it I, I guess you just treat it as valuable as the software engineering component itself and you'd ensure that those people bringing that knowledge has have as, have as much of a voice at the table as everyone else. And I guess it's about running good teams, right? It's about building teams with healthy dynamics where people feel like they're listened to and they're their ideas are prioritized as well. So I guess it's really about how you how you run if you're if you're doing agile, how you run your sprints, how you run your retros, how you run your planning sessions, uh, making sure that the security specialists are at those ceremonies, making sure that they have a voice, probably what I'd focus on. That's what I was going to ask actually, if you think that security team should be involved in those ceremonies and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, because if not, it is, you're back to that same old problem where it's like it gets to the end of the build and you're like, oh, you need to do all this other stuff. I know that there's there's definitely places that I've worked where you've literally ticked something off as complete and then someone's gone, nah, <laughs> nope, you've got loads more work to do. This is the list of all the problems I found. Please fix them before we let you release that. And obviously, you're not only pissing everyone off there because, <laughs> you know, it's really demoralizing having to go back to the drawing board on something you've just done. You're also just creating a lot of friction within the team and creating some weird dynamics. Yeah, absolutely. But I think it works both ways. And so one of the aims of this podcast is to get people like yourself, Josh, on and talk about, you know, what would your sort of dream security interaction look like? And that's not to say that all the effort needs to come from your side. But I think a lot of effort does need to come from the security side. And traditionally, we have just kind of waited for people to get in touch with us. And there's so much more we could be doing in a proactive space. And I'm hoping with um, this podcast that learning about how you work in your engineering function, how you know we've had people talk about data, um, got someone coming and talking about cloud eventually as well, understanding, you know, what does a day in the life look like and being able to meet people halfway at, at the very least. 
rather than just kind of passively wait for someone to care about security. And I think more people do care about security. I think that's definitely a security misconception is that people don't care about security. They do, but they've just got other things to think about as well. No one comes into work wanting to do a shit job. And that includes nobody comes into work wanting to bring down the company with shit insecure code. They don't, they don't, but they've got other priorities. So it's about understanding those priorities, I think, and understanding that your deliverable as a security person isn't going to be the same as a functional piece. Mm. It's like like what you said earlier about um, product managers having a responsibility to represent the security requirements for a a particular feature, for example. It's about ensuring that it's prioritized at that part of the conversation. And I guess it's it's back to that kind of classic matrix of like accountability, responsibility, like who who are you tagging those, those kind of labels on? Because everyone's responsible for security just because you have security specialists in the, t- in the company championing what should be done doesn't mean it's their sole responsibility to do that. And I think it's about just ensuring that everyone understands their responsibility to deliver secure applications, accessible applications, all the same stuff, really. I find that's a really interesting one because I was about to ask about this and I found this increasingly as, as we incre- increase the number of things. 25 years ago, it was the team developed some software and then it just got magicked off. We never saw the infrastructure. We never even necessarily saw the QA team. And now we're bringing more and more cross-functionality into the cross-functional behavior into teams. And some of that maybe means that we have to wear multiple hats. And I think that's really interesting. Like, how do, how do we better encourage people to, because I still see a lot of roles and a lot of teams where and effectively, everybody's a unitasker. Everybody's like the kind of avocado pitter or something. And, and where actually you kind of, in some teams, you need a proper set of chef's knives for an important delivery. And how do we, how do we build better cross-functional teams? Because you can't just keep making teams bigger. Because we've found that big teams don't really work. And breaking them up into silos, well, that doesn't work either. It's, it almost feels like a little bit of a contradiction at times. Mm. Yeah, I mean... You know, when, you, when you're talking about some of those old approaches to QA, like I remember the days where you just get like a PDF back with all the failed, this is everything that hasn't worked for you, Be- better fix that. <laughs> there wasn't even like a dialogue between the teams, like the teams weren't even talking to each other. It was like literally a PDF was passed between them, uh, which is absolutely bonkers when you think about it. At least they could have done is put t- change that into a Jira ticket. At least you could have done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, literally. At least use the issue tracker. Come on. Yeah, I, I think it's just about. I guess it's that classic organizational design problem, isn't it? Really, it's how how do you get your old design right so the right things are prioritized? Because really, a lot of it starts with org design, doesn't it? Like how the teams interact with each other. If the squads are like full stack squads, where everyone you know everyone's in the squads, or whether they sit outside the squads, chapters, you know, all, all the different ways that you can organize teams. I think the org design is quite a, a big part of that and it's something you should spend a lot of time on i guess one of, one of the other things is being in the in the heat of delivering software and we all know that unfortunately i'm sure there's a, there's a vast gulf between the amount of time and resources we'd like to deliver something and, and what we actually get and there's a kind of iron the, there's the old-fashioned iron triangle of you know the, the cost the time and and the scope some people put quality in there i refuse to do that but there's the with with security, there's, there's another triangle, and I'm not talking about the CIA triad, about that mixture of uh, usability, functionality, and security, and you can't have all three. Can you see a world where that wouldn't be the case, and what can we do to help with that? You mean a world where all three are respected equally and... and- yeah, so just for our listeners, um, the, the theory behind the use of um, the sort of that triangle is that you, the closer you move towards usability and functionality on this triangle, as you move move across the lines of it, you've moved further away from security, uh, and therefore you have to make a kind of trade off between. If you want it to be really usability focused, you might have to give up a little bit of functionality. You might have to give up a bit of security. But if you want to be really security focused, there's a trade off. You you, know, you um, downplay the usability and functionality piece. That's just a little aside for our listeners that might not have come across that. I think it's about the kind of strong leadership, to be honest, to really create the space in delivery to prioritize those things. The problem is once you've had delivery at a faster speed without those things, it's really hard to walk back and to get those things reintroduced. It takes strong leadership to to prioritize those things and go, look, we're going to slow down a little bit. But the reason for that is because of all these other things. You know, maybe maybe your, your argument is our competitors just had a breach and we need to ensure that we're doing our due diligence or making sure that we're baking these things in from the start. So I think I think if you're in an organization where slowing down would cause serious friction, you need strong leadership in place to go, but we have to do it. It's not it's not a, not a conversation, you know. It's something we have to do as part of the cost of running business. 
No, I like that. I like that a lot. Well, that's um, all the questions we had for you, Josh. Do you have anything to you want to add? No, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, to be honest, you know, it, it's made me realise when I was looking through some of the, the topics ahead of this is that I probably don't talk about security enough myself. <laughs> um, so it's certainly something I'm going to be taking back to the teams and, and maybe talking more with the teams about because some I think a lot of it's based on assumptions, isn't it? You, you base a lot of your viewpoint on assumptions that everyone else understands the world the same way you do. And, and that's not necessarily the way. So yeah, it's been really enjoyable to, to talk through it. Brilliant. And if people want to reach out to you and find you, where can they, where, where can that be? Yes. I would have said Twitter, but I'm hating that place more and more every day. But I'm, I'm at Josh Nesbitt on Twitter. Podcast we do for, for the Hey Presents brand is called Offscript. So if you go to heypresents.com, you'll see more information about All Day Hey, which is the single track conference we do once a year in May. Uh, and also the podcast that I run with my pal, James, uh, called Offscript. So check that out too. Cool. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks for having me. Wow, some fascinating insights from Josh there. What did you think? I, I absolutely thought so too. I mean, one of the key takeaways from the discussion I felt was really the importance of collaboration, culture and leadership all kind of combined to help us achieve those three elusive things, functionality, usability and security all at the same time. Yeah, because it can be done, but it can only happen if you've got good leadership to really prioritise quality delivery at all costs, which can be really a hard sell in the modern environment. Well, like I've said in the past, it's really hard for a function like security, which is traditionally a non-revenue generating function to be seen as adding value in that traditional dev sense. Um, agreed, it's kind of up to leaders and CTOs like myself to really commit to security as a priority and make it part of our definition of done. It's hard, but not impossible. And I think Josh has really given us some really good advice on how we can start building our relationships with the engineering team. So thank you, Josh, and thank you to our listeners. Yeah. Links to everything Josh discussed in this episode can be found in the show notes. If you like the show, please do leave us a review and share on LinkedIn or in your teams. It really helps us spread the word and get high quality guests like Josh on future episodes. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe. We hope that you enjoyed this episode. See you next time. Keep secure and don't forget to ask yourselves, am I the compromising position here? <laughs>